Hi, hi everyone. So we, uh, as a group, so I'm Cristiano. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Thanks everyone and uh, Mr. Augusto, to, uh, Father Augusto, to invite me. Uh, basically, we, I'm, I'm, my experience is uh, uh, from a from a private company, multinational company. Uh, a huge monster of almost 500,000 um, employees. And uh, uh, we uh, set the uh, context by um, mentioning the, uh, what we uh, together agreed to be the uh, technocrat, uh, technocrat paradigm. So uh, the future of work will be different because uh, digital and, uh, and human, because uh, uh, work will be organized by tasks and project uh, because there will be uh, need of uh, uh, more collaboration leveraging uh, the new uh, technological uh, instruments and then uh, uh, we switch our focus to skills and the uh, most vulnerable uh, um, uh, uh, worker in this uh, scenario. But suddenly our uh, discussion uh, took a much higher uh, level and uh, this is where we really uh, start to uh, together share something uh, much more different and something that I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to, to share with you. We ask ourselves and uh, thanks to all the contributors that uh, I also invite to, uh, to join and to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we start to think about, uh, for instance, the, we started like uh, uh, discussing uh, the fact that jobs is a sort of uh, recent uh, definition uh, from the ancient time what only exists uh, is work and this emphasis also is a, a first point from where we uh, change the paradigm so it's not about jobs it's about work work for everyone work that is not uh, um, every one of us needs to work uh, because there is need for work so jobs is a sort of categorization, is, a, is, is, is the jobs from where we, from a lot of issues start, because jobs is uh, given to specific people, people are identified with the jobs, so whenever they change job, uh, social issues also arises, and issues related to uh, a change, and uh, uh, these other stuff. Um, technology, really is a mean, is a, uh, is a media, is, uh, is a mean, and uh, uh, is, uh, is an opportunity for us now to really start to rethink on, uh, uh, with a, uh, much more time, uh, and we can free up our time leveraging uh, digital technologies to think about values, purpose, education, and the way we basically uh, live together and relate uh, to each other. So let's, let's have technologies to uh, help us to uh, decouple some uh, um, connection between, for instance, uh, uh, work and uh, uh, workplace today we don't really need to have a uh, uh, to have a, a, a full-time presence there uh, let's have uh, uh, let's decouple uh, the um, the paradigm of having just collaboration among among colleagues let's open our uh, um, ecosystem with uh, uh, third party government uh, private companies and so on. Let's focus on uh, uh, real values. Uh, let's restart to think and to give value to the different kind of words, not jobs, 
we were mentioning and uh, uh, um, like jobs such as teachers, such as nurses, uh, journalists as well. Uh, sometimes these technologies are now uh, um, creating systems in which those uh, works are uh, um, commodo commoditized. This means that uh, we uh, we can pay for a, um, an article uh, for euros per hour, uh, but I mean we are really um, this is not what we uh, this is something without any control. This is something that goes uh, in a direction that unfortunately uh, the technical uh, the technocrat paradigm. Uh, it doesn't seem that is addressing or uh, tackling. That is the uh, uh, redistribution of uh, uh, income and the, the, the redistribution of wealth. That is uh, uh, unfortunately out of any discussion on the uh, future of work. However, our emphasis was again, and then I close, on values, education, and. Uh, um, and technology can only help on this. Learning technologies, experience, uh, experience uh, learning technology, uh, collaboration technologies, uh, and uh, so on so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cristiano Colombaroni. And indeed, you know, just the, the fact that you are bringing us today, like uh, the non deterministic approach that we have to take, and uh, also towards unemployment, you know, that was discussed about the fact that uh, we need to find solutions for the human beings that are all uh, touch upon and also at the community level, bring us straight into. Uh, the second group of technologies and governance, I think, where they will also have uh, uh, some uh, uh, answers to uh, our question. And I think that Pierre Martino Lagarde is going to uh, report about that work. Thank you, Anna. I'm not sure I have answers. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. I'm not sure I have an answer for you. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to thank Augusto right now, or maybe at the end when I've done <laughs> with my job. Um, you know, in the Gospels, there are two ways of telling the good news. One is to tell a story, and the other one is to bring some concepts. St. Paul do does bring a lot of theological concepts, and the Gospel tends to tell a story, a narrative. And I find it very hard for our group to tell the story, so I would bring some concepts. <laughs> <laughs> so I would be more Polynesian than, uh, than uh, going with my patron, uh, Peter. Um, co um, four areas or four key concepts. First one, I think if we speak about uh, technology and governance, the first one which comes up is is that we have to engage a conversation about values and meanings. Meaning of work, but also values about being together, searching for a common good. I don't think we can speak about, uh, but also pursuing of one's well-being. It's a question of the place of the self-interest. I mean, a number of issues come, come up, I think it came up in the conversation. The second thing, um, as I draw from our conversation, is that by putting the two words together, uh, governance on one side and technology, su surprisingly, uh, I think the, the notion of anthropology, or what it means being a human being connecting in the middle of all those changes is getting into uh, a lot of importance. Uh, so anthropology, the basic concept of uh, anthropology first is time, you know, I mean, uh, aren't we living at a speed which is unusual? I mean, what, what is actually speeding up and what is slowing down? Space is a second concept, I mean, uh, I, I think to understand who we are in terms of uh, human beings and uh, in relation uh, in space and where we are located. Locating ourselves, I think, comes into play. 
Uh, in relation to that, I think the, the two other ones also are very uh, idea which uh, we connected to this anthropological context are de uh, dealing with the notion of relation and relationships. So on one side, what is an individual life and how do we live our individual lives and self-fulfillment, self-realization, and at the, at the same time, communities. Who are we caring for? Who are we living with? Are we connecting our lives to other people in time and space? And how do we connect them? At which space? All that is affected and comes into play in the conversation. Third, I think, interestingly, we had a sort of controversy about what reality is. And I think that's an interesting piece, uh, which is not to be disregarded into our own assessment and among us on the assessment of the reality. Who is actually, what are, how our lives are changing or supposed to be changing in that context? And do we agree on how differently lives and of people and communities are affected by those changes. Uh, positively, negatively, we had a huge uh, and a little bit hot debate about the positive and the negative uh, aspect of um, having different activities or jobs to all together. Was it positive, negative? And who was affected by that reality? In one sense, I mean, is a series of so-called bullshit jobs is this an act plus, uh, with the understanding that there are a number of situations where the addition of several situations is indeed a positive uh, and valuable situation. And how do we go about reality check? I mean, what do, and can we govern, and who should be, and have access to which type of knowledge? Uh, understanding uh, uh, to do and to make uh, informed political decision. We had also a debate about whether politicians should know or not know about the space and the changes in technology and how much it is important for them to know or not know or ignore consciously. <laughs> and we could, which could be also a sort of agreed blindness, if I may add, which was not in the debate. And lastly, uh, I think, uh, surfacing, uh, we had mentioned about the role of our institutions and organizations uh, with different level uh, of reflections. First, that we inherit a number of institutions, organizations, of patterns of organizing ourselves. I mean, from the global level to the very local and reciprocal. I mean, we have, we inherit uh, forms of organization from trade union, employer organization, uh, civil society, NGOs, and, uh, which is also a very, and all are coming into play. And so we inherited and they are also affected by the changes. Uh, and uh, governance is, uh, is in a sense bound to change and those organizations are also bound to change. Those are uh, organizations which inherited are not, I mean, are ambivalent. I mean, they are not good or bad. They have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. Uh, one of the things uh, which we have looked into is that, for instance, from the private sector, I mean, the, government, the governance structure is not always performing the way it should be performing or should be improved in the way it should be performing, provided board institutions are doing their job rightly. The same with uh, global institutions, for instance, where we can also acknowledge that there is a fragmentation of governance, I mean, from the trade, from the environment, from the technology, where we have a perception that the change is global and transversal between the idea. We also inherit a structure of governance which is uh, fragmented or in silos, and this fragmentation, we just mentioned the fact that it was fragmented at the global level, but at the global level, it is a replication on the way our tradition of uh, Western governments, which have been uh, 
spread over uh, in many forms all over the world are divided into area which not, all, not all, uh, always speak to each other and this is probably euphemism. <laughs> and uh, lastly about institution and organization, I mean the question which comes into play right after is this articulation between levels and I think it came, it came into play yesterday, it came back today is how we articulate the different level, what is right at the local, national, global, regional, uh, and global level, and whether this is, um, uh, uh, this is properly, and how we can articulate it today, uh, given that uh, a number of, also our technological instruments are changing the way the levels are, are, can be, should be, communicating with each other. I mean, there is also a whole thing of that, uh, we had examples of processes to to create transparency in that communication in the white sense, uh, but uh, it's still uh, it's still a question uh, for us today. And in the social doctrine of the church, there is this Thomist concept of subsidiarity, which is one form of articulation between the levels, and maybe we need to reflect on that. Having said that, you see that you don't. I mean, uh, I see that some of the people in the room at least were not nodding as I was speaking, so I was not probably too far away from the narrative. <laughs> uh, but bringing you back uh, the story more into a sort of concept, with a series of conceptual images, uh, which I hope will help you uh, um, Think through it and continue the reflection, and I think it's a, it can be an important piece to bring to, get, uh, to us tomorrow as we go to our ethical conversation. This being said, having put the subs suspense in front of me at the beginning, I can thank Augusto for having <laughs> putting me in, in my place. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre, and indeed, I, I think that, uh, you know, that was a, a difficult, probably, conversation because it is uh, at the heart of what we will have to do eventually, and I think that, indeed, it's a, it's a good reflection for, uh, for uh, opening up tomorrow morning in, in the final uh, uh, reflection, and, uh, uh, but I think that uh, the fact that uh, we bring, uh, you know, the, the, what you mentioned about the reality check, the governance structures, you know, the articulation of levels, you know, it's uh, are issues that we need to keep in mind because, uh, again, talking about the common good that has to be built in a way of uh, uh, making sure that uh, each different level talks to each other and, uh, and we find the sense. So, on this one, uh, Julie Sullivan, maybe you have also, because you are looking at the new uh, uh, jobs or uh, uh, the green, you know, what do you have to tell us? Well, um, our group started our conversation with a, um, a question. We, we all thought about how we might answer the question, um, how we could accomplish a, a, a just transition to new and green jobs that will enhance humanity and human dignity in the digital age, which seemed to be a good place to start in terms of what could we talk about that would help us perhaps take a different perspective about accomplishing the design and implementation of new and greener and different jobs as our future unfolds in this rapidly moving technological space. So we, we started off actually by recognizing and, um, and, and talking about the different perspectives that it takes to actually have these kinds of conversations. And that started, I'm sure it did with the other uh, working groups as well, in terms of the number of people that were in the room who came from different backgrounds, different perspectives, and different ways of looking at what it means to achieve the common good and what it means to enhance human dignity. So that was really an interesting start. And then we actually moved on to uh, looking at, similarly to what the previous working group 
talked about the different levels at which we have to have those perspectives. And we have to have those perspectives at a systemic level and then also at a corporate level, a customer level, um, and then even just individual level. So there has to be a, a significant understanding that this has to be done in a systemic way. Then we talked about what we thought would be really, really critical for those new jobs and what they might look like. And so consistent with what I think we've heard a lot of in, in this conference so far is the importance of education. And education in a variety of ways, but we really focused on education in terms of critical thinking. We, we've talked previously here in this conference about uh, educating people for skills in dealing with uh, technologies and, and the digital age. But we actually spent more time talking about how we can educate people so they can think critically about what is happening with the technologies and the jobs that are being designed so that we could identify and share potential job dimensions de and designs that have a human content as a critical piece with uh, what we talked about as a dignity opportunity. And that would create trust. So for us, we spent a, a, a fair amount of time talking about how we can accomplish that by not only educating people for skills, but also educating people in all levels about how to think about things so they can avoid unintended consequences. And another piece of that was something that, I, that echoed uh, what Bishop Ty talked about on day one, and that is when we're talking about educating in critical thinking, we have to talk about the reciprocal listening process. And too often, humans have a tendency to jump into a perspective uh, about technology or even an, an enjoyment uh, or excitement about a technology without listening to others that might have a different perspective or have some idea about what some potential consequences might be that we, could, that we might be able to avoid. So that was a, a very important part of our conversation. And then we spent also a fair amount of time talking about how the fog that essentially is what this new job wave looks like. With technology moving as rapidly and, and all of the change that's happening, we have no idea what those future jobs are going to be. So how can we see through that or find a way through that so that we can actually try to learn and design what jobs might be useful as we go forward? And um, there were a couple of really interesting uh, perspectives about this, and one of them was, this is a place where we could use technology, not to suggest that we don't want humans to be a crucial part of the, the work and the job, but we also want to be able to use technology to help us understand what those jobs might be as, as we go forward. And as part of that, we spent some, a fair amount of time also talking about redefining um, the definition of a job and also redefining the value of work in the sense that we would have individuals who go to work and why do they go to work? What is it that they value, that they really need? And not only on an individual level, but a collective level. What is it that we value that we would want jobs to provide? And that was a very interesting conversation because we, we talked about potentially doing that through the healthcare system because people in general, regardless of background, uh, geographical location, uh, race, gender, ethnicity, are interested in their health and maintaining their health. So we thought maybe we could leverage that as one way of starting to redefine what the value of work might be and by doing that at an individual level and then also at a collective level, we would be able to move forward toward the, the common good. Now the 
latter piece of that particular conversation also talked a little bit and focused, we focused a little bit on the idea that this can be done, redefining the value of, of jobs and um, identifying potential jobs can be done, but not with technology alone, which is consistent with having the human content involved. And we spent a little time talking about what, what it means to have the human content involved. And we've talked about human dignity, we've talked about lots of different things, we've talked about trust. But this, we had some very good specific examples of uh, what one of the members of our group called indigenous architecture, which is looking at the art and skills of individuals who are indigenous to a particular area that could be used in addition to technology. And there were different examples, but one could be masonry. Masonry is, there's a lot of science involved in masonry and there could be technology involved in that, but there's also an art to masonry. And there's something about that piece that we need to remember as part of that, that human content for the jobs that we're gonna create in the future. And I had a very nice time with my group. I really enjoyed it. We did not have any you know, significant disagreements. We actually had a really productive time. So I'm gonna cut it short because I could go on for a long time. So that's, that's enough for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julie, and indeed, you know, to bring this uh, just transition uh, the, the way you did it also uh, in order to link the different levels in a systemic way when you were saying, but also the choices that are both uh, uh, in order to, to have a transition that is really owned by the communities and not only by the individuals, and I think we'll uh, come back and also to to the uh, discussion that we did before, but also I think that is linked to, to what uh, Monsignor Edouard is, is uh, uh, going to tell us, and uh, he has uh, negotiated more time, so I had to give it to him, but not too much, eh? Uh, Go uh, ahead. I don't need, need not so, so, so much time. Um, maybe I, I can just uh, start by presenting a very short uh, elements of the white paper I did uh, to introduce uh, the subject. Technology and community integration. So we started from the constatation that work is more than paid employment, but also includes all other forms of human activity that contribute to the common good, including family work, voluntary work, and contemplative work. And work is more than a way to make a living, but an integral part of our human identity and defines our role in society. And so, from the perspective of Catholic social teaching, uh, we <coughs> pointed to three subjects, uh, three meanings of uh, work. The first one is to take part in creation. Work refers to the common responsibility to care for the world as given by God and transmitted by past generations. The second one is to fully integrate into society. <laughs> work helps us find our role within the community and is a primary mean towards a truly inclusive and active society. Work gives us social recognition. The third one is to foster our personal development. Decent and sustainable work is a setting of rich personal growth, where many aspects enter into play. Creativity, planning for the future, developing our talents, living out our values, relating to others, giving glory to God. And so from that, uh, we can see some challenges and fundamental questions um, about the transformation of work. I 
proposed three challenges. The first one was technology increasingly replaces jobs of the middle class and causes anxiety about employment and social decline. The second one was digitalization led to new forms of employment which don't fit in the current labor rules and may fail to provide security, especially for young people who are entering in the active life. And the third one, the new world of work provides opportunities and risk for balancing family, social, and work life. How do we manage this uh, together? In our group, we had uh, a very active uh, discussion, I would say. And uh, um, what I have understood uh, quite uh, from the beginning is that we don't have exactly the same meaning, the same comprehension of what does the common good means. And it's interesting to, to listen to that. And uh, how the common good is more than the addition of personal goods. Uh, we have seen also that from our uh, geographical origin, the approach was quite different. Between European one, what I have prepared is was very European, and uh, uh, I'm also rather proud of that. And but we've seen that uh, from an American point of view, the situation is quite different because. Uh, uh, the point is more placed on the role of the individual. And so uh, individualization of, uh, uh, of work. And we have also the third point of view coming from developing countries and uh, pointing um, the fact that the new technologies uh, can bring a lot of changes in work in those countries. We've seen, uh, we have also seen the, the importance of education, as it was said in the other groups too. Also this kind of uh, vicious circle between the worker and the consumer. Because the worker, uh, as he has limited uh, access to, to, to money wants to consume uh, the goods who are the cheapest. Uh, we've seen also the problem of generations because uh, the new technologies are not so wide uh, developed by elder people. And we've seen that uh, a lot of people don't have the full access to it. What does it mean? Um, also, another point I can uh, notice is that it would have been useful for this uh, topic to have a kind of discussions between workers and employees. But we had no representatives of uh, trade unions and uh, uh, employers, uh, quite few. And um, so we were discussing maybe on a more theoretical uh, point of view and not enough uh, on the real and concrete uh, sort of conditions of life of the people. Uh, that's, I think, the main thing I can uh, say about what we discussed in our group. It was a very interesting discussion and um, with various point of view, very different.
and uh, uh, you know, thank you, Monsignor. And indeed, uh, you know, it's like I think that uh, what you brought to the table, and I don't, I don't want to reopen the discussion, <laughs> but uh, but it's really important also in terms of what do we link to work and mm. also. You know, the, for example, the definition of employee was also because a series of uh, rights that were attached to that were come were come out also including on the uh, collective bargaining and and uh, agreements and this is very much a European also uh, also American. But you know, it's like uh, the important thing is that all workers eventually have certain rights, have certain uh, possibility. Uh, um, to fulfill themselves and also the community. So I think that tomorrow all the, the challenges that you raise will also continue in our uh, uh, discussion. I think uh, I, I have the time for, um, first of all, giving back the floor if they want uh, to my three uh, uh, discussants uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, Malcolm, uh, Oliver and uh, Aziz, if you want. Do you want to come back? You want to come back? I see, I see my Aziz always want to come back. It's good. He's my brother from Bangladesh. So I want him, you know, <laughs> I want him to, to uh, he's there. And so maybe, and so, and, and then we open up, uh, I don't know if we have the time for uh, another couple of interventions. Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. We have okay. 20 okay. minutes. So actually now they wake up and what is Oliver? I don't see. Uh, you want it? to speak to, yeah, all the three of them. Mine was only a very quick one, actually, because I spoke about the EMIM project earlier, um, and I just wanted to, to say that we are still looking for, for organisations that might want to, to partner with us, that might want to be involved. So if so, please do see me or contact us via, uh, via our website. I just uh, wanted to stress one point making uh, during our working group. I think when we look at the common good, we have to look at two aspects. First of all, what is a common good and actually how we can achieve it. And uh, the thing is, talking about what the common good is, is normally the easier question because you don't really have to go into detail. The real problem is, how do we get there that we get the common good? Thank you. So, very simple. Let's uh, think technology is an enabler. Um, so we have uh, very heavy, um, all uh, research-driven applied, uh, the artificial intelligence blockchains uh, that's injecting into, into um, a more human and machine interaction type of applications, which is good, which is we need it. And that can do good things, bad things. Um, and, but let's flip the coin and, um, and how do we turn into uh, good, for common good? And um, so some of the application, even distributed computing, that's blockchain uh, really based on, which is, I had the opportunity to do that, work on the distributed computing back in 90s, very early, back in 80s, really. Uh, now it's blockchain, it's a fintech, and uh, cryptocurrency, and others. Um, uh, and neural networks that have been uh, involved with the medical technology, with the, um, uh, the deep learning uh, uh, area. What we try to, we try to solve the issue that's today, and at a very simple way. Uh, very, we can say low cost, high impact solutions. Very low cost means that we are, I mentioned that with the uh, uh, bishop was pro, uh, presiding, we are capturing rainwaters for, for the people who, doesn't, uh, who don't have the clean water in, in the areas that, uh, uh, for massive uh, population. Uh, so that we are injecting technology into it. We have a um, uh, uh, rural area, ECG machine to read cardio, uh, and that uh, they cannot read it, uh, or they cannot really, uh, the specialists, there are not many specialists in the rural area to uh, see that uh, readings, whether that is uh, good or uh, bad reading. So we are injecting ICT into it. You can 
call them whatever you like, IoT and applications and all uh, intelligence. But it's simply adding the IP interface to the existing technologies. And it's serving thousands of thousands of even millions of people if we can really find a way to bring them faster. Um, so uh, we are injecting into that IP address to the uh, probably 100 years old ICG um, machine. And uh, we created something uh, content for, we call them rural doctor's course. So rural doctor's course, they are very simply learning through YouTube and other content and reading those uh, machine, uh, through the machines and, and sending to the hospitals or specialists. So it's serving the purpose. Is uh, so we can make an proactive, uh, proactive uh, decisions. So let's think about that. Um, we are uh, so worried about that. Um, is going to lose jobs and this, but is going to uh, even in the top of the things. I mean, uh, machine language is going to replace uh, machine like uh, or ma the the human that very much interacted, blended with the factory lines. That's going to be robotics, and it's good to be. It's good for us. It's good for human also. And there is, um, uh, so that's in from the even ethical point of view. That's that's good. In the machine with the with the heat and atmosphere that we have, whatever we say is practically is very hard to really improve the quality of the uh, condition. We see that. So machine robotics is good. Let them work 24 by 7. So we can do that quickly, and we can come up with somehow the strategy to meet the basic needs of this uh, human being, from the building the human capital to, to upgrade their skill sets, uh, reskilling them. And, um, and we can do that. We can all continue to thrive. I believe in that. And uh, let's turn into that. Um, uh, th that uh, encouragement without frustration with the, with the new technology uh, and that we have today for, uh, for all of us. That's what I want to do. Thank you, Aziz. Let, let's see if other uh, friends that were not uh, in the first panel, but if they feel the urge to add something. And if not, because I know that you have, I know why you don't, you want to go because there is something waiting for you downstairs, but I'm not going to tell you until you have heard at least my three words. Ah, there he is. Okay. Ah, two more. Very, very, very. We have up to six. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jordan Wales. I'm a theologian at Hillsdale College. Uh, it was asked earlier, uh, what do we value uh, that we want jobs to provide? And uh, so it's important to reflect on the role of work in human flourishing. And there's one particular aspect that I'd, I'd like to suggest that we might think about, and that is uh, that work can contribute to human flourishing by being fully involving. I teach at a liberal arts college uh, where there's a great emphasis on flourishing, not as merely providing for one's material needs or pecuniary gain, but as the development of one's human faculties. Now, that sort of educational approach or freedom from financial worry is not a luxury available to all. Um, for some, the, the paycheck is an overriding concern. But uh, just as an example of uh, work that can contribute to flourishing even without being uh, high-minded, uh, a, a friend of mine was the uh, president of a garbage collector's union. So here's some collective bargaining and organization. They were faced with the uh, roboticization of their uh, garbage collecting trucks. There was going to be a robotic arm that was going to lift the trash can into the truck. And all the garbage collectors hated this. It was marketed as uh, relief from backbreaking work, uh, but they hated it because the, the full involvement of the upper body work of pitching the trash into the truck, that was the work for them. That was what was enjoyable. I'm, I'm not arguing that we should return people to mines without heavy equipment because it would be more fulfilling. But nonetheless, it's a point of an example of a, a very menial job uh, in which the workers nonetheless found uh, uh, fulfillment because they were fully involved. So I think the question uh, to ask as new jobs uh, uh, come to be is, uh, is will we uh, promote jobs, the development of work, that uh, supports uh, flourishing by engaging in some full manner as this, even the full 
physical manner, which doesn't mean it's going to be able to engage all human abilities in a deep way. But those abilities that it does engage, uh, we would do well to, to consider how those abilities can be engaged fully. Thank you. Not too sure how to uh, follow on from that. Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart Hutton from Simply Ethical and the European Partners for the Environment. It was just a few points um, to pick up from discussions I've been listening to and also from our group as well. One was around technology offers opportunities, but also offers a situation where it can create greater difference between those who have and those who don't. And I think the access to information and to data you know, we'll go to those who can afford it, and we need to be very aware how that, you know, will affect and impact what we're trying to look at in the terms of the common good today. The other bit that we picked up with, I know you didn't mention on purpose, but was around the dignity perspective and the fact that you know, we're trying no longer to call humans, employees, um, no longer called an asset. And in fact, I think the, the point we then picked up and followed in our group was that actually they no longer should be an asset, and we need to look at it from a different perspective. And we need to make sure that work is also a necessity. It can be a necessity to pay off personal debt or societal debt. I think we need to kind of reinvent the way economies work. And how we see this now looking at it is not just about the economic return, but also the humanitarian returns. The, the, the final point I wanted to kind of raise was we must be more action-based. And we talked right at the beginning yesterday about creating actions that we can deliver on. And we must be more outcome-focused. And the Sustainable Development Goals already offer us these, this kind of opportunity and how we can define the way we can act towards achieving these. And I think to this kind of just transition and paradigm shift needs pioneers. I think what is interesting is that sitting in this room the last two days, we, we are all pioneers in this and there are many people out there to recognize and work together collaboratively, we can achieve the things that can be, you know, want to be done. I'd just like to make a quick comment uh, as, as well. I, I think the point about human flourishing is an extremely important point. And we were talking about the, the value of work for the collective and the common good. And I think the part about human flourishing is, is, necess is a, necess a necessary part for the individual <coughs> value of work. So I completely agree with you, and I think that's one of the things that we, we touched on as we were talking about this. So I couldn't necessarily summarize everything, unless you want me to be here for another half hour. <laughs> so that was why. Uh, hello, good evening. I'm Hint. Um, uh, I work as a curriculum specialist in the Ministry of Education. I study mainly the impact of everything that is framework and reform on the field. Uh, I have now a positive thing about technology. When I say common good, I think about what technology can offer to people such as Stephen Hawkins or Christopher Reeves. These are very big scientists and Hollywood actors who really could have lost their capability of communicating with us theories or common good for humanity, but technology has helped them to survive, to make their life better. Even Christopher Reeves, you know, the Superman, and he lost after an accident, again, his vertebral colon, and technology helped him to survive even better and to support his family. So uh, technology, in a way, along with all these children with special needs, autism and uh, others, Garrett, he's in health science, can help, of course, all of these kids that really need technology to express even the thoughts or to, exp to read and to share their, their maybe writing. So technology in a way can do the common good, but we need again, and we said in the group that was really active and um, that we need to define technology's usage, not limit its usage, but define it and manage it in a way to answer these inequality, these needs, uh, gender, women in labor, uh, uh, poor that they cannot really be there, and come from the bottom of the pyramid above and down. 
we, we cannot use only one taxonomy, Bloom and Web, and that's it. We need to create a new taxonomy with the use of technology in order to define this common good together. Thank you. I just want to say a word that really has been included in what has been said, but it is to emphasize the importance of community. That did, uh, came, it was very present in our conversation, and I think sometimes we think about community uh, in the abstract, or we theoretically uh, uh, refer to community, but I think that what we need to bring to this whole process is um, um, an assurance that community will ensure that everyone has access to a decent life and that the whole process of um, accepting, of making use of, and of, um, of uh, guiding the ability of, di of uh, the digital technology to help us do that, I think is important. But at a fundamental level, it's about community uh, it, it, if we're talking about the common good. Thank you very much for today. Um, I believe that the, um, I, I run the World Data Economic Forum, um, and my name is Paula Schwartz. Um, I believe that the framework of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations um, and institutions that are um, helping to actually foster and grow them across the world are a great um, opportunity so that we can actually measure also the social and ecological profit apart from um, only the financial profit. So um, what I'm doing with the World Data Economic Forum is one, to show the financial profit that we can generate through good structures and data. And on the other hand, what we can also show is actually the social and the ecological profit. So um, I do not want to only show the great numbers that we're making for the economies that are going wrong today, but I'm also showing you tables of what we're generating for the people, for the planet, and for the growth of the next generations to come. And um, I encourage you all to do that too, and to follow these guidelines. Thank you. Hello, Gareth Presh, uh, founder of the World Health Innovation Summit. But, um, I just think we have a, a fantastic opportunity. We do have solutions, technology is there. We can also learn from technology companies, platforms, and move from a digital age to a knowledge economy um, where we share and create value that's shared within our communities. And also to look to the future uh, I personally have two young children, six and three years of age, and I want my daughters to grow up in a society that is about the common good, and let's use our collective knowledge to deliver that. Thank you. And indeed, I think that uh, this last uh, intervention brings us back to what uh, uh, yesterday, do we have somebody, oh, see, yes. <laughs> Just a very, very simple and short question. I heard that there are some differences in what is the definition of common good. So why not to refer to the definition that Pope Francis gives in Laudato Si, number 156. He said very clearly what is common good. An integral ecology is inseparable from the notion of common good a central and unifying principle of social ethics. The common good is the sum of those conditions of social life which allow social groups and their individual members relatively through and with access their own fulfillment. <laughs> Sorry, one word, not as a, as a organizer. Thank you, thank you, Chair. <laughs> uh, following up of uh, Professor Tarantola said, something that we can, we discuss it um, 
a little bit in our group, but I want just to bring up uh, this uh, notion of the common good in Laudato Si, uh, and thanks to bringing the new future generations and the environment. But also, is Pope Francis says, the litmus test of the common good is the preferential option for the poor. When it translated into uh, general language means only to our conferences, is the digital age, or is this the digital development, really helping the lives of the least advantage? Because if it's not, in, at least in our perspective, from a Catholic perspective, it not necessarily, even if it's good development, even if it's a fantastic technology, not necessarily is contributing to the common good. And this for us is a good challenge, because it's very easy to get fascinated by technology. Well, I, I just can't believe what things uh, uh, are, uh, what we are already able to do. So, uh, but is it, is it happening? This is are we, are, how are we thinking the, the new jobs? This is what uh, some, uh, some aspect of the projects with uh, uh, Father Pierre Martino Lagarde that we love. Uh, so, what are the kind of jobs that we want to protect? And what are the kind of jobs that we want to promote or to create? Because definitely we cannot create jobs that are polluting the environment, because this will, have, uh, will affect the, not just future generations, but the, the poorest in our own uh, time. So this for us is, um, and thank you, Professor Talantola, for bringing this up, uh, because this for us is a big challenge also to all the, the panelists. Now, I really appreciate the white papers that you presented, because I think if you haven't read it, please have a look the white paper uh, that are already online, that might bring us some, some uh, possible with, with what we have already discussed, like uh, lines for action or, line, or, or for future research or for future, um, yes, I, I don't know, thinking. So maybe if, we, if, you, if, if you can synthesize, if, if, if any of the panelists want to say a, a word of, about this, with this litmus test, about, uh, I would really appreciate it. Uh, I mean, it's something that came to my mind since uh, we started the discussion. So uh, maybe I repeat myself. However, uh, we have the technologies, no? Because uh, you were mentioning uh, the, for the pool, uh, there are projects, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, empowered by uh, United Nations uh, that help uh, um, uh, refugees in the um, uh, on the field, for instance, Lebanon, uh, leveraging uh, um, a gig economy, so working on the micro task that help them in their refugee uh, in their country, such as Lebanon. Uh, Iraqi and etc. To work, to work, to earn something, and also to learn. No, so uh, th those goes in the direction of uh, tech for food. Uh, we 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 mention. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, technology uh, can help us to uh, uh, to don't work on the more routinary task, no? Because uh, artificial intelligence and ad and robotics uh, are transforming uh, the nature of work, no? So uh, humans can really focus on more added value activities. Further, uh, cooperation and collaboration. There are so many tools that we are already using, such as. Uh, um, uh, cooperation and collaboration tools, uh, social networking, interactive portals uh, that can really help us uh, spreading out the knowledge uh, and uh, uh, um, going forward uh, the limit of uh, pres um, physical presence. No? So if we, can, if we imagine, uh, yes, sure. Uh, if we imagine the fact that uh, a surgery can uh, uh, operate a person and other people from uh, uh, the other part of the world can learn, then... Uh, so, by the way, there are other thousands of examples. However, the point is, how do we um, use and uh, uh, in which way we use those technologies? 
I will just uh, insist uh, about the last uh, interventions we had about the common good. I think we have to, to reflect uh, about it, not, not only on the meaning of uh, the principle, but how to act it concretely in the economic and social situations. Thank you, and I think that indeed we pass the ball to the discussion tomorrow. You know, <laughs> one thing that uh, I think it came out, and uh, no conclusion, just one minute also for me, Every panelist, uh, you know, re responding uh, uh, to, to the discussion today brought the word values as the first one uh, in each discussion. And I think that we have to restart, uh, you know, indeed from there. I think also that it came out very clearly the idea that, uh, you know, as much as we say we don't know which jobs will be there, uh, what happens, we don't know everything will be disrupted, uh, let's not be scared you know just like we can it's any process can be managed and uh, and i think that also what uh, as much as we don't know what uh, uh, the regulation will be but what's what's coming from here is that we can have a governance and uh, we should make sure that we have a governance that respect uh, indeed the dignity at work i i think that also something that uh, came out implicitly is that we need to have some goals that are simple, you know, like uh, we need to share the benefits uh, and empower as many people as possible with the new technology. So, you know, it's like, again, you know, let's not make this uh, something, a task that we cannot achieve. We can do things, we can regulate, we can empower communities, you know, and we can do this together. I think uh, also the human in command, the fact that we don't have to feel like, you know, the robots are the one that uh, will uh, define this and again because the common good is something that uh, you know is shaped is given to us is passed uh, uh, also through the generation i think it was uh, and and as aziz said you know it's like you know it's like uh, technology can be an enabler i was struck yesterday by um, this definition when i think it was uh, Father Taig, uh, Taig that said, uh, I was in a train uh, in India and there were the people, the, the scavenger hunters under the train and I was on the train. I think it was him who gave this. And again, you know, there is dignity in those workers uh, that trying to find a living under the train. I think uh, this is also our responsibility. We are part of that community. We are in together. And I think that uh, Tomorrow, you know, the questions, uh, you know, will find their answer. And also, thank you very much for this exchange.